with Chad Pergrams live up on Capitol Hill. This, th this had been talked about, Chad, our senior producer uh, for, for the Hill, but was uncertain whether he would do it because it, it, it seems certain that there will be legal challenges. There will be, you know, he has under the statute uh, the ability, there's about, uh, you know, multiple reasons as to why you can declare a national emergency, and he, he does have firm ground there. But, but the thing I would look more carefully at, Shep, is what we call transfer authority. So if you have individual spending bills, and they've only allocated $1.375 billion for the border wall, does he go around Congress and try to move money from, say, account A to account B inside that spending bill without – without getting the blessing of Congress. Part of the statute says that you have to get a sign-off by the Appropriations Committee. Part of the statute says you can go around that. Or does he say take the Department of Homeland Security spending bill and then dip into the military spending bill, the, the Defense Appropriations Bill, or what we call the VA MILCON military construction bill, and go across spending bills? That, Shep, could be where there is a greater legal challenge. That's the bigger problem right now. And, you know, the other thing, Shep, that's going to be very important is whether or not uh, this decision to declare a national emergency actually affects the vote count. Now, what we're going to have happen at 3.30 here on the Senate floor is what we call a cloture vote, to end debate on the underlying spending package. Remember, these are seven spending bills. One of them is for the Department of Homeland Security, and that's the most nettlesome because it has the wall issue there. Uh, they need 60 votes to end debate on that and then go for, if they get 60 votes, then the Senate will vote actually up or down on passage. Here's the other issue. I think it was very significant that Mitch McConnell waited and waited. We thought we might vote earlier on this, but he waited until he had an assurance from the president that he would sign the bill to call this vote this afternoon, Chef. This, this matter of declaring a national emergency, uh, John Roberts is – we'll go to John Roberts at the White House in just a minute. But, J John, this is something – you know, to what degree there is really influence, I, I don't know, sitting here as one who does the news and, and doesn't do the commentary. But all the people who are out there making noise for him have said, okay, go ahead and do this, but you better sign a national emergency. How yeah. much of an effect has that had? Do we have a way to know? Well, I think he's got a lot of backup from people like Mitch McConnell. He's got backup from uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who weeks ago said that the president should give a certain amount of time to negotiations, and if he doesn't get what he wants at the end of the negotiations, declare a national emergency. I, I just got off the phone with a White House official who says, in fact, that, yeah, uh, McConnell spoke to the president, and uh, that's what was said in the conversation. So, I mean, that's a huge piece of news that the president's going to sign this, but at the same time declare a national emergency. Now, Chad was talking about the intricacies of, of this transfer authority and reprogramming money within certain – it's like think, think that you've got a farm. Think of the federal government as a farm, and the farm's got a bunch of silos on it, and each one of those silos is filled with money. And you're allowed to move some money around within each of those silos, and you're also allowed to move certain amounts of money in between the silos. Now, if you declare – a national emergency, it gives you greater leeway to be able to move money around in between those silos. And White House attorneys have looked at this for months, this idea of a national emergency, and they have identified certain baskets of, of money that they believe can be applied to building a border wall. Uh, each, each time you dip into a different basket, though, you're increasing uh, the level of potential pushback and, and your potential risk for a legal challenge. So some baskets of money they believe they have that they can use and nobody's going to be able to challenge them. But once they go through those bas baskets of money and pick up the next basket, that comes with a little more risk. And then each basket after that comes with an increasing degree of risk. So as you move this money around inside you know, specific silos like the DHS silo, or you move from the DOD silo into the DHS silo or energy into, you know, just for example, into the DHS silo, you, you get increasing risk. So it's not clear how much money the president might be able to move around before he ends up in court. But I do know that the, the o, OMB office, Office of Management and Budget here at the White House, has identified far more than the $5.7 billion than the president originally wanted in these baskets of money that it believes it can move around. It just, it's, they have to make a decision on to what degree do they risk inviting a legal challenge here because once you get enjoined, then you run the risk of almost everything getting enjoined in the courts. I want, I want our viewers to hear what uh, Mitch McConnell said on the, on the floor here. I've just had an opportunity to speak with President Trump. And he, I would say to all my colleagues, has indicated he's prepared to sign the bill. 
He will also be issuing a national emergency declaration at the same time. And I've indicated to him that I'm going to prepare, I'm going to support the national emergency declaration. So for all of my colleagues, uh, the president will sign the bill. We'll be voting on it shortly. So there's Mitch McConnell. Jo John Roberts, what's the national emergency? Uh, well, first of all, the reaction is, wow. I mean, a lot of people thought that the president might use this option, uh, but there was a lot of thought that he probably wouldn't use the option. He has said uh, many, many times uh, that he would rather do it legislatively, but it's clear that the president thought that he could not do it legislatively, so now he's going to declare the national emergency. The national emergency, as the president sees it, is a humanitarian and economic emergency that exists across our southern border. Tens of thousands of people are being apprehended every month by Customs and Border Protection, the Border Patrol, Immigration and Customs Enforcement for crossing over into this country or being in this country illegally. Customs and Border Protection facilities are filled to bursting. Uh, there are a lot of family units. There are a lot of unaccompanied children that are coming across the border. And the president believes that the best way to deal with that is to build a border barrier, uh, add an additional 200 and some odd miles of fencing, particularly in Texas. But here's the rub with that. Uh, when, you, when you're talking about these migrants, these illegal migrants from what are called the Northern Triangle countries of Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, and, and uh, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, uh, and El Salvador, they are people who simply want to get their feet on American soil so that they can be picked up by the Border Patrol. And the, and the President himself, a couple of weeks ago in response to a question I put to him, acknowledged that because you cannot build a fence right on the border in Texas, you can't build it in the floodplain of the Rio Grande, you have to build it you know, a couple of hundred yards in, in some cases the wall is a mile in uh, from the border, all those people have to do is cross the Rio Grande, and in some areas you can float across, in some areas you can walk across. And if they get their feet on U.S. soil, they give themselves up to the Border Patrol, they get into the system where, by and large, they get released into American society. Some of them do return for their appointed court date. Some of them don't. Even if they uh, come for their first court date, they very often don't come for their second court date, and so they disappear into American society. So build as much wall as you want in Texas. You're not going to stop the problem of these migrants who want to get caught by the Border Patrol from coming across. Now, where it could help is people who don't want to get caught, who get into the country. That would include uh, people who just want to disappear into American society right away. They don't want to get caught by the Border Patrol. That could include criminal elements. It could include human traffickers. It could include drug smugglers and other people with nefarious intent to get across the border. They could, would get caught up ostensibly, theoretically, by this wall, which would give Customs and Border Protection time to get to them before they hit these what are called vanishing points and disappear into the United States. So from that standpoint, it could be beneficial for Customs and Border Protection. But in terms of stopping the flow of migrants who are coming up from Central America who just want to put feet on U.S. soil, it wouldn't do much to stop them. And the President has admitted that. Jeff? All right, John, thanks. It took just over an hour and about seven minutes for that vote to take place, and it's confirmed by a vote of 54 to 45. Bill Barr will return to that job he previously held from 1991 to 1993 under President George H.W. Bush, and he's going to immediately face intense scrutiny from two Democrat-controlled House committees, Judiciary and Intelligence, who are preparing broad investigations. Now, that vote ran almost down party lines. We saw a similar pattern that we saw in the procedural vote, where three Democrats uh, crossed over. That is uh, Cinema of Arizona, Mansion of West Virginia, and Doug Jones of Alabama. One Republican objection, uh, Rand Paul, but the main objection came from Democrats that Barr would not remain independent, taking control over the special counsel's Russia investigation. In repeated questionings, Bill Barr made clear that he would not stand in the way of letting it run its course, and he pledged to make public as much of its findings as possible, but he stopped short of promising it would be released in its entirety and that was a sticking point angering Democrats who worried that he might try and suppress critical portions related to the president in the findings based on Barr's expansive view of executive powers. 
Now, under special counsel regulations, we need to note, Mueller is required to provide the Attorney General with a final confidential report of findings. And those regulations also require the Attorney General to inform Congress of those findings. They do not, however, require Barr to release all of the information publicly, giving him some latitude on what and how much to release. Judiciary Committee Chairman Gerald Nadler is reportedly hired two veteran lawyers and Trump critics who will dig into Mueller's conclusions when they are released. And in the Senate, we're already hearing about a bipartisan bill put forth by Senators Grassley and Blumenthal that would require Mueller's report to be made public, removing Barr from being in the position of deciding exactly what to release. And now we're already getting, uh, while that long hour vote was taking place, we're already getting reaction. Press Secretary, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders saying that it was a major victory for justice and the rule of law. And we got some feedback, a statement from Dianne Feinstein, the ranking Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, saying that she uh, could not uh, see that he, Dem Barr, demonstrated his independence, saying that Barr refused to commit to its findings, and that was disqualifying. Can, can I just stop you for one second? Did you say that uh, Representative Nadler is already planning to go into whatever gets released by Robert Mueller that has not been released by Mo Robert Mueller yet? That's right. Uh, reportedly, we are hearing a story today that Nadler on the Judiciary Committee has hired two veteran lawyers and Trump critics who will dig into Mueller's conclusions when they are released in whatever form it is, whether or not it is partial or in its entirety. Right. So uh, Bob Barr takes the job again, and he is going to be immediately cast into fire. Well, William Barr said during those confirmation hearings that he would... Uh, follow the protocol. I talked with Senator Lamar Alexander off the top of this newscast. He said he spoke with him directly about that, uh, and that was his anticipation that, that it would be released per the rules and regulations. Griff Jenkins with the breaking news on a brand new Attorney General for the United States of America, William Barr. Thank you very much.